Okay. Welcome everyone to the Southern Maryland Audubon's program. For the, and thank you for joining our program on uh, saving the, ti the tiger salamander, the Eastern tiger salamander and the recovery that's being done in Maryland. Southern Maryland is dedicated to the protection and appreciation of birds, other wildlife, and their habitat across Southern Maryland and beyond. Our monthly nature talks and bird events are free and open to everyone. You can check out our events and see recordings of our past programs on our website at www.somdaudubon.org. That's SouthernMarylandAudubon.org. If you're not a member yet, we'd love to have you join our flock. You can join us and or you can make a donation right on our website. Now, I'm happy to introduce to you our speaker. He's Kevin Stolgren. He joined the Maryland DNR Nat Natural Heritage Program as a Southern Regional Biologist in 2022. He has broad experience in non-game conservation and management. He completed his bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife biology at the University of Missouri and his master's in forest resources working on eastern diamondback rattlesnakes at the University of Georgia. He worked in herpetology conservation with the Orion Society in Georgia before moving to Maryland. After working as a naturalist for the Maryland Park Service at Gunpowder Falls, he worked as an environmental consultant, gaining certifications as a qualified bog turtle surveyor and forest interior dwelling species observer, in addition to conducting bad, um, bat habitat assessments, restoring habitat for bog turtles, and conducting stream surveys for macro invertebrates and a variety of rare plant and animal survey projects. His duties with the Natural Heritage product and pro Program include population monitoring and habitat restoration for rare, threatened, and endangered plant and animal species in the southern region and beyond. So with that, I give it to you to take over. Kevin Stolgren. All right, thank you, Barbara, uh, for that introduction. Yeah, as she said, my name's Kevin. Uh, I'm the Southern Region Biologist with the Natural Heritage Program. We are the branch of the Wildlife and Heritage Service that works with all our rare, threatened, and endangered species, uh, doing inventory, monitoring, management, as well as our environmental review. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you all tonight about Eastern Tiger Salamanders, a favorite species of mine, uh, and our recovery efforts in the state. Uh, as Annette mentioned, uh, next slide to go. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, I can answer them between slides or whatever is convenient. Uh, I do prefer these things to be a little more interactive if possible, which is harder when these are, are virtual as opposed to in-person, but um, you can also put questions in the chat and we can get to them at the end, uh, whatever's convenient. Um, so first of all, first off, I'll introduce you guys to our focal species here. Uh, and put in the chat if you've ever seen a Eastern Tiger Salamander. I assume a lot of folks haven't seen them in the wild before because they are pretty secretive and here in the mid-Atlantic that are pretty uncommon. So Eastern Tiger Salamanders are, uh, we consider a, a mole salamander. They're in the family Bistomatidae. They're called mole salamanders. In fact, they spend much of their life underground in burrows. These can be burrows created by small mammals like moles or other rodents. Uh, it could be uh, a root channel from a decaying tree. It could be any other natural cavity. Uh, and they also do have the ability to dig their own burrows, particularly if they're in an area with loose sandy soils. Uh, in this mole salamander family in Maryland, we, ha we have four species. Uh, two of which, if you have any experience with salamanders, you may be more common or uh, you might have some knowledge of uh, because they are more common. Up in the top photo, you see a, a marbled salamander on top and a spotted salamander below that. These two species are virtually statewide in Maryland uh, and are both pretty common in southern Maryland. Although, uh, if you don't know when and where to look for them, they're pretty rarely encountered. Um, 
these species all breed in seasonal wetlands. So these are our wetlands that uh, are wet, holding water for part of the year. In our area, they hold water from winter, winter and spring, and it will dry up in the summer through the early fall. Uh, the, the dynamic nature of these wetlands is important for these salamanders because it, it prevents the establishment of predatory fish. These uh, salamanders can't survive when there's things like bluegill and bass in the, in the wetlands. So they use these seasonal wetlands that are, are fishless. Uh, they are able to use permanent uh, bodies of water if they lack fish, things like, um, you know, uh, retaining ponds or ditches sometimes can, can be used. Uh, and uh, these species uh, have a, a very robust size in general compared to a lot of our other salamanders. If you are familiar with any of our woodland salamanders like redback salamanders or streamside salamanders like uh, two lines or dusky salamanders, those are in the family Plethodontidae, which are lungless, and that necessitates a, a smaller body size and they're pretty lean. Uh, these salamanders have lungs and are our are, are most robust terrestrial salamanders. Tiger salamanders in particular are the largest among them and are our largest terrestrial salamander in North America, reaching sizes of over a foot long, really only bested by our permanently aquatic species like hellbenders, uh, things like that. As far as identifying a tiger salamander, obviously in this photo you can see they look most similar to spotted salamanders. They are much larger in general. Uh, our spotted salamanders are only about five or six inches long as adults where our tiger salamanders, as I mentioned, can grow over a foot long, uh, but are typically eight or nine inches in length. The spotting on tiger salamanders is more uniform across the back. Uh, if you look at this uh, on the tiger salamanders, it's more uniform. On the spotted salamanders, the spots typically run in two rows. And then if you look at the tails, tiger salamanders have a very uh, lateral Wonderful. tail. Uh, Wonderful. Very, very paddle-like. Uh, the mic's them, off now. Uh, allows them to, to swim oh. uh, very effectively when they're in the water. Why? Hi, John. Would you be able Yeah, thanks. Um, and at least in our region, uh, tiger salamanders, the, the yellow spotting in my experience is a lot less... Uh, bold it's it's more muted more faded on on them than it is on spotted salamanders and once you've seen a few they have a very distinctive face and look to them um that it's it's hard to describe but uh pretty easy to pick out once you get used to seeing them so as i mentioned all these these mole salamanders they all spend most of their year in burrows underground and not in the wetlands so they actually will migrate to their breeding wetlands. This is not a migration like you would expect in birds, but just something of, of a few hundred meters going from those upland burrows into their breeding wetlands. And of these three species I have showing here, they all have different strategies for how they, they breed in these seasonal wetlands. So the marbled salamander at the top will actually migrate in the late fall during some, a rain event uh, they'll move into the dry ponds, they'll breed, and the females will lay their eggs under logs and other debris within the dry pond basin and wait for it to fill up with the winter rains, which will flood the eggs, and then that's when they hatch out. Spotted salamanders will wait till the uh, early spring, the first kind of slightly warmer spring rains you get in March or early April will cause them to migrate to the wetlands uh, when they're completely full already and then the females will lay their eggs in the water. Tiger salamanders fall in the middle. They generally move uh, you know, anywhere from November to April uh, with the males moving first in some of our first colder winter rains, just as the ponds are beginning to fill up. And then a few weeks later to a month or more later with additional rains, the females will, will show up and, and breeding will take place. That's usually around January uh, in our region. And once the females show up, the males will do a little bit of a, a courtship dance to uh, 
try to attract a female. Uh, if she if finds one that's receptive to him, he'll move off. He'll lay down a spermatophore, which is a little packet of sperm on a stalk that gets placed on the, the bottom of the pond. And then the female will swim over top of the spermatophore and pick it up with her cloaca. Much like a bird, salamanders have a cloaca, which is like a single opening that serves multiple purposes, including reproduction. And so after she picks up that sperm packet, it will inter it'll fertilize the eggs internally, and then she'll swim off to lay her eggs, which she attaches to some uh, suitable vegetation. Uh, you can see here sexual maturity, two to eight years. Longevity for tiger salamanders is about 25 years. That's, that's the long end, but it's certainly not uncommon for them to live uh, a decade or more in the wild. They're pretty long lived for a salamander. Uh, an adult female will breed every year or every two years or so. It depends on the weather conditions and the uh, her body condition, whether she's uh, eaten enough to be able to um, have enough energy reserves to produce eggs. Uh, a female averages about three egg masses uh, when she does breed, and the average number of eggs is around 40. Uh, per egg mass, but it, it can vary quite widely. Here you can also see the range of the eastern tiger salamander. Um, uh, for those of you that are in, into birds, you're probably familiar with lumping and splitting. Eastern tiger salamanders were, were split off of the western tiger salamanders, uh, and most sources accept that split. They do have a certainly a distinct morphology and, and life history habitat. Here in the, the Midwest and in East is certainly very different from the habitat the Western tiger salamanders utilize out in the Western US. Uh, and if you look at the range map, you can see there the Midwest is really the core of tiger salamander, Eastern tiger salamander range. And up in the upper Midwest, uh, the species can actually be really common. It can be very abundant, it can be one of the most common salamanders within uh, those that part of their range. When you get down to the, the East Coast, uh, the species is, is very uncommon. Most of the eastern states give them some sort of legal protection. Uh, the, the populations tend to be very isolated and small. That is certainly true in, in Maryland, where they are listed as, as state endangered. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Here a little bit more on, on the, the breeding life cycle. See a photo on the top left of uh, a tiger salamander female laying her eggs. She's attaching it to uh, some vegetation on the bo bottom of the pond. They typically choose the deepest part of the wetlands where there's still something to attach their eggs to. After she lays an egg mass, begins to take on water and swell. You can see in the top right and bottom left photos, they really swell up with water and there's a, a gelatinous coating around the, the egg mass as a whole eggs incubate for 20 to 50 days, and then they hatch out. The larvae are highly predatory. They eat a variety of invertebrates, uh, as well as other amphibians. They'll eat tad small tadpoles. They'll eat other salamanders. Uh, if there are any, um, uh, you know, if the prey density is, or pre density of other larvae is high enough, they'll eat other tiger salamanders as well. They'll um, cannibalize. So basically anything that they can they can fit in their mouth, they will. Because they live in these uh, dynamic uh, seasonal wetlands that do dry up, it really is a race from the time that they hatch to take on as much food and get as big as they can so that they can metamorphose before the ponds dry out. Uh, if we have a particularly dry spring, it is possible that the ponds will dry before the larvae are able to metamorphose and you can have a failure. Uh, Really dry winters sometimes lead to um, no breeding at all. Uh, last year we had a good wet winter, had a lot of eggs, record numbers of egg masses in Maryland, uh, but then ended up having a really dry spring. Um, so we're not completely sure how that affected uh, reproduction in the end, but our wetlands did dry out uh, pretty early last year. And that larval period takes at least two and a half months, but can last longer if it stays wet and there's plenty of prey in there the larvae will stay in as long as they can. Uh, but generally, once the, the trees start to leaf out, they really start to take up a lot of water. That drops the water table level down. 
and starts to dry these wetlands out, and that will trigger metamorphosis in the larvae. All right, so in, in Maryland, we'll talk about the habitat that they utilize. As I mentioned, they, they need these seasonal wetlands, but they, uh, in Maryland, our current populations only occur over on the Eastern shore, and they all occur in what we call Delmarva Bays. Uh, these, these type of bays occur from New Jersey into North Florida. You get into the Carolinas, they refer to them as Carolina Bays. Other names are potholes and whale wallows. But really they, what they are is these, these coastal plain ponds. They have a, a northwest to southeast orientation and they're elliptical to oval in shape. And they have a, a sandy ridge around the edge. These are isolated wetlands. They don't have an inlet or an outlet for water. Uh, they're not connected to other bodies of water. So their, their source of hydrology is just from the groundwater level and, and whatever rain we get. And so that contributes to that uh, important wet and dry periods of these wetlands. And tiger salamanders in particular require the open canopied Delmarva bays. These are the open canopied meaning there's, there's no trees or very few trees within the, the sandy perimeter of the wetland. And that promotes uh, an herbaceous growth within the wetlands as well as shrub cover. And it's these wetlands that uh, have the most number of rare plant and animals over on our, our eastern shore. There have been over 2,000 of the Delmarva bays identified on the eastern shore, but only about 1% of those are the open canopy type. So it's pretty, pretty rare. Uh, it's considered a globally rare community. Here's a, another image of those wetlands. You can see that elliptical shape, the northwest to southeast orientation. In the right, you can see the, the one labeled as Ghost Bay. There's really two of them there. Uh, what has been a, a common uh, practice for agriculture and forestry has been to try to drain these, especially on the Eastern shore, everything's really wet because it's so low lying. Uh, there's been attempts to make everything as, as usable as possible. So they will ditch the wetlands and try to drain the water out of there. And then often fill them in to try to raise them up enough that they'll be suitable for other needs. So that's just another uh, component of the loss of habitat over on the uh, Eastern shore of our Delmarva Bays. Here's a couple images of one particular bay to, to show that uh, wet and dry cycle of these depressional isolated wetlands. You can see in January that this wetland is completely full. The trees don't have any leaves. That water table is as high as it's going to get. Wetland is filled out to the brim. And then in June, uh, that, that wetland is almost completely dry. Uh, and then at the bottom, it's indicating that that, that cycle really uh, uh, ensures that you're not going to have any establishment of predatory fish, which is good for our amphibian breeding populations. A couple more images of uh, these Delmarva bays. These are two of our best tiger salamander breeding wetlands. You can see uh, the tremendous amount of herbaceous growth to go on that one on the left, and the one on the right has some more shrub cover as well as some herbaceous growth. These were taken uh, in the summer, the wet, the one on the left is is completely dry there. The one on the right is really drawn down. There's only a few inches of water there. Uh, these things will fill with anywhere from two, three, five feet of water, depending on how much uh, rain we get, how high the water table is. So that's that's the structure we hope to see in in these tiger salamander wetlands. And while we're talking about tiger salamanders. Uh, some of the, the rarest elements within these uh, bays is, are actually the plants. There are a few other rare amphibians we have here in Maryland, like barking tree frogs and carpenter frogs. We have quite a few rare plants. Some of them are considered globally rare. Harper's Thimber Stylus, uh, one of them. Um, American Feather Foil, that photo on the bottom, uh, you can see is a really neat uh, floating aquatic plant. Uh, and then Purple Bladderwort. At Boltonia, some creeping St. John's wort. These are really, really cool, uh, rare plants. They're all listed as threatened or endangered in Maryland because their uh, habitat is so limited. 
uh, and they require those open canopy delmarva bays. And then of course they're used by more common amphibians. They're used by a whole host of odinates, dragonflies, damselflies. Some of those are, are rare as well. Um, so really important wetlands. And earlier I was talking about how the mole salamanders and tiger salamanders uh, migrate from their wetland. So when you're talking about the conservation of these species, it's not just about the conservation of their breeding wetlands. Uh, it's not enough to just put a buffer around that and protect that and say they're good. You have to really look at a whole life zone. You have to look at how far they can move from those wetlands to their upland habitat, which is can at least several hundred meters and put a buffer around that so you're protecting that upland habitat as well, uh, which for tiger salamanders, you need to be protecting probably at least 500 meters from these breeding wetlands in order to truly protect our populations. So when we conduct, conduct surveys for our tiger salamanders, there's a number of methods that we can use. Um, the one we use the most, uh, if you see in the upper left, we do egg nest surveys. Our, our now retired uh, herpetologist, Scott Smith, has been monitoring our tiger salamander populations for a long time. And every winter has gone out multiple times after uh, a few days after any winter rains that could uh, lead to tiger salamanders migrating to the wetlands to reproduce. Uh, and he goes out with a bunch of buckets we call these muscle buckets because they were developed for doing muscle surveys. And these are homemade contraptions. There are commercial varieties you can buy, but these uh, homemade varieties work just as well. If you cut out the bottom of the bucket, put in a piece of plexiglass, and uh, the, the hard part about doing these surveys is you're out there standing in several feet of water, potentially up to your chest, and trying to look down. And if you get any glare or any ripples on the surface of the water, you, you can't see into the water at all, even just a couple of feet. So we use these buckets and you basically just stick your head down in there. And that it's like having a pair of, of goggles without having to get your face wet and be able to see in there. And we walk as much of the wetland as we possibly can, trying not to step on any egg masses, but we uh, count every egg mass that we find and we mark it with a stake. Um, so we know if we counted it before, and then if we come out on a subsequent event, we can count additional egg masses because not uh, the entire population of tiger salamanders won't necessarily move during one given potential breeding event. So we'll go out multiple times to count the egg masses. And then what we do is we divide our number of egg masses by three because a female generally lays three egg masses uh, each year. And that'll give us the number of, of females more or less that bred that year. And we use that as an index of breeding from year to year. There are other ways to survey for tiger salamanders, including doing uh, larval surveys, go out with nets and, and dip them up and try to capture them. Uh, but they're pretty hard to capture. Uh, we don't tend to catch very many. And so getting a good index from year to year is tough. You could also flip logs around the wetlands, which we always do when we're out there, but it's pretty uncommon to find tiger salamanders, so we don't uh, rely on that as a, any sort of index uh, of, of how our populations are doing. So the uh, egg mass surveys have been our, our primary method of, of determining how good our, our populations are doing. And while we're doing those surveys, you have to be able to identify a tiger salamander egg mass, which I showed you before, but there are several other amphibian species that lay eggs that could be confused with and could be uh, breeding around the same time. Tiger salamander has the most similar egg mass. Uh, the shape of the egg mass doesn't, doesn't really matter much, but it's the consistency. They both have a gelatinous coating around the eggs, but on a spotted salamander, it's very solid. It's, it's like jello. It holds together really well. The tiger salamander coating around the outside is very watery. If you were actually to try to pick up that egg mass, it would basically run through your fingers. And so if, if you're in a wetland and you're trying to identify the egg mass, you just kind of give a, a gentle touch to it. You can really tell just by barely touching that egg mass, whether it's a tiger salamander or a spotted salamander. Wood frogs breed around the same time. 
their eggs don't have that outer coating around the around the mass, so it's pretty easy to tell those. And they also tend to really pile all their eggs on top of each other in the shallow parts of the water. You won't see that with, with tiger salamanders. So if you go out and you see a wetland and you see dozens of egg masses all kind of piled on top of each other in the like late winter or so, that's wood frog eggs. And then things like New Jersey chorus frogs also breed around the same time. They have really small egg masses. There's nothing else beyond these that you would really confuse them with. And here's, again, one of our good tiger salamander wetlands. This was in one of the photos earlier. You can see all the stakes where uh, egg masses were found in the previous year. Mm -hmm. This is going out in the summer to collect those sticks when the wetland is completely dry. And so I was saying uh, all of our known tiger salamander ponds are on the eastern shore. Uh, we, we know of a, a, about 17 extant breeding ponds that are all in Kent and Caroline counties. There is a pond in Sussex County, Delaware, just across the state line where adults have been found in Maryland. Uh, so we kind of encompass that life zone, that whole buffer for that population does, part of it does fall into Maryland. And you can see on the Eastern shore, our populations used to be much more extensive and have just disappeared due to uh, habitat loss and, and degradation over time. You do see there is one, one spot for a historic site in Charles County in Southern Maryland. That was a good population back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and unfortunately, a golf course was built on top of it. And that population disappeared and hasn't uh, been found since. So it's, it's a bit puzzling why there's not more records on the Western shore. We are hopeful we'll be able to find some populations. Um, you know, things, things do pop up. So it would be really nice if we can determine that there's some on the Western shore. Although we don't have Delmarva Bays that could be using other types of wetlands as long as they're these seasonal fish with wetlands. They should uh, potentially be suitable. All right, so now that you know everything you need to know about the life history and biology of eastern tiger salamanders, we can talk a bit about uh, our recovery efforts for the species in Maryland. And so because they utilize these Delmarva bays, our, our focus has been on vegetation management within these uh, bays and restoring them back to that open canopy uh, structure that they many of them would have had. Again, there are over 2,000 on the eastern shore and only about 1% are open canopied at the moment. Uh, we're not looking to restore all of them. It's nice to have a, a, a variety, but increasing the number of those open canopy wetlands uh, around where our tiger salamander populations are. We can hopefully expand the number of wetlands that we have. Uh, here are a couple of images showing some of our more closed canopy wetlands. What happens is uh, some species, native species, but we consider them invasive in these habitats like red maple and sweet gum and Virginia pine will really start to move in. And once they do, in the well, one, they close the canopy up when it's leaf out and you really lose the herbaceous component and the shrubby component of these wetlands. You see that wetland on the left has a lot of uh, sphagnum moss on the bottom, but doesn't have any herbaceous growth really. Uh, these wetlands can be good for marbled salamanders and spotted salamanders, but we rarely, if I ever find tiger salamanders in these type of wetlands. And those trees, the more you get in there uh, during the growing season due to transpiration, they really suck up a lot of water and cause these wetlands to dry out faster uh, than they, they would have if they're an open canopy wetland, which is detrimental to the amphibian populations of things like tiger salamanders. So our restoration efforts have been focused, uh, focused around uh, removing that woody component to these wetlands. We do that by manually removing them, cutting them down, uh, as well as using some herbicide treatments. What you see in the center photo, we call a drill and kill method. And it's a very targeted method where you can do a small drill hole in a tree, add a little bit of herbicide, and, and just affect that one, because we don't want to affect any other wetland vegetation in there. Uh, and 
we've really seen a functional response from our tiger salamanders, barking tree frogs, and the, the rare plants that we have in these areas at these restored sites. Uh, enough to convince us that this is really a, an effective method for restoring Delmarva bays. Uh, we get a lot more herbaceous growth uh, as well. And these wetlands hold water for longer. It also changes the pH of the wetlands um, and becomes definitely more suitable for things like tiger salamanders and our rare plants. Here are a couple of images of wetlands that we've worked on in the last few years. So these are still very early in the restoration process, but you'll see there on the left, you can see a number of uh, trees that have been, been killed there and you're getting a lot more light to the bottom. You can see on the photo on the right, you do get a response from that herbaceous component uh, that really starts to develop uh, once you can get more light in there. And, uh, you know, this, this is great for our tiger salamanders. Uh, and I mentioned also all our rare plants. We It's a goal of, of really any of our restoration management is really to restore communities. You know, we, we focus around areas where we have RTE species and then try to restore communities as a whole. As a whole. And uh, that's good for our rare species. It's also good for common yeah, species. You know, uh, I'm ready. Uh, and... Uh, we've done this work in cooperation with our wildlife staff, too, uh, who's uh, indicated that this work is also beneficial to things like wood ducks. Uh, we know wood ducks will use forested wetlands, uh, but by killing some of these trees, we create snags that can lead to being uh, potential nest trees in the future. Also, the increase in herbaceous growth and shrub growth is good for uh, the young ducks after they've jumped out of their cavities. Uh, provides cover for them. So these uh, restoration efforts are good for things beyond just the tiger salamanders. And beyond uh, just our habitat restoration, um, our, again, uh, now retired herpetologist Scott Smith in his, his last year um, kind of kicked off uh, a translocation project to try to speed up our recovery of tiger salamanders. And this isn't the first attempt at translocations in Maryland. Uh, there have been two previous attempts on the Western shore in Hartford County in the late seventies and in Charles County in the early eighties. Uh, they made attempts to collect larvae from our good populations on the Eastern shore and release them at sites in the Western shore. Unfortunately, neither, neither of those attempts proved to be successful. Um, but this, this attempt, we are focusing on Delmarva Bays on the Eastern shore uh, that are uh, pretty close to our existing tiger salamander populations. Uh, in this photo, you can see a, a restored site, uh, a recipient site. Um, it has some, a very open canopy and good, good herbaceous and shrub uh, cover. Um, so here are photos of some eggs. So what we did is we went out and collected egg masses. We had, as I mentioned earlier, we had basically record breeding as far as we've documented egg mass wise this winter. So we felt it was a good opportunity to collect a, a few egg masses. So we collected a total of 18 egg masses from four different ponds of some of our, our best breeding sites. Uh, uh, and we collected them in jars. As I mentioned, they're, they're very loose egg masses. So they were they were scooped up in jars to keep them together. A total of 18. So we used two recipient ponds, we divided them up nine, nine per pond. It came out to about 15 larvae per egg mass. So not nearly uh, as many eggs in these egg masses as, as like the average, which is around 40. The pretty small egg masses. Uh, and one pond received, I think, about 120 uh, eggs with, of those nine egg masses, and the other one received about 150. So it sounds like a lot, but it's really not that many uh, on the grand scheme of things. 
And what we did, because the uh, the females would attach these eggs to some vegetation, and obviously we were removing them from the vegetation or putting them in new ponds, we actually put those egg masses into some mesh bags and attached those to stakes. These mesh bags, uh, big enough openings to allow the larvae to, to squiggle out once they hatch. But we'll keep them uh, secure to some structure while they're still developing. Uh, and here you can see us uh, attaching some of those mesh bags. And then we did follow-up surveys. Uh, I wasn't able to join in that, but out in May, uh, Scott and a couple of other folks went out and did some of those uh, larval surveys with dip nets to attempt to try to see if any of these larvae made it from the eggs uh, mesh bags and made it through the kind of the larval development process. So we went out towards the, the end of the larval period. Unfortunately, did not find any larvae. Again, it was a very dry spring, so the wetlands were really drying down. Some of them could have already migrated out. Uh, but also, it is also, as I mentioned, pretty difficult uh, to get uh, larvae during these larval surveys. Um, they also surveyed one of our best wetlands on the same day and only captured one larva. So again, it could have been that it was a little late given the wetlands were drying down or just a factor of that to the fact that um, larvae are really hard to catch. And when you're only releasing 120 or 150 in a pond, they're, they're very well diluted uh, throughout there. And so capturing one's pretty hard. So we do plan to, to continue this effort, releasing more larvae in the future, more eggs, and uh, probably do some additional uh, monitoring efforts. One, one thing we'll probably attempt is to do a fence around these wetlands, what we call a drift fence where uh, you encircle the wetland with something like silt fencing. So as the larvae actually metamorphose and try to make it out of the wetland into the upland, uh, you'll capture them in, in a trap. We'll either use pitfall traps, which is like a five gallon bucket sunk into the ground. So when they larvae are coming out and they hit the fence, they'll have to turn left or right and, and then just basically fall into a bucket where we could go uh, capture them and then release them on the other side. And that will also allow us to, in the future, trap in the winter uh, when the animals potentially would be coming back to the wetland to breed. So that, that would be the, the true sign of success would be having a, a functional reproducing population within these wetlands. You know, you can't just keep releasing eggs indefinitely and not have any of these things become reproducing adults. So we really need to determine if these wetlands eventually years down the, the road, because it takes at least several years for these things to become mature, uh, if any of these come back and are actually able to reproduce on their own. So that will be the goal, but it'll definitely take more egg masses in the future and additional survey. All right, so that's uh, what I have for you in terms of the, the biology and our recovery efforts at the moment for Eastern tiger salamanders. Um, so do we have any questions? Hopefully it wasn't going too fast. No, Kevin, that was really interesting. Um, and there are a couple of questions in the chat. So I know Eddie Rivas has a question about the pond in Sussex County, Delaware, whether that can be identified. Um, there's a question about whether it's on public or private property. Um. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what he's asking for about whether it can be identified. We because it is a rare species, we don't um, you know, we don't advertise or, or distribute any of the locations of any of these wetlands. Um, those that pond is is monitored by uh, in terms of uh, you know the way we monitor our ponds in, in Maryland, they're monitored by the um, Delaware um, Department of the Environment. That makes sense. And then um, Maggie Brockert has a question about how do the salamanders contend with the, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this properly, with the mesahaline slash brackish waters of Maryland? Uh, well, 
not, I mean, tiger salamanders definitely don't breed anything brackish. Again, these uh, Delmarva bays are isolated. They're not connected to any of our, our other waterways, uh, especially the uh, tidal waterways, anything receiving brackish water. Um, uh, and, but in, in general, uh, other species of salamanders are mostly restricted to freshwater environments. There are some, uh, um, you know, exceptions to that. Usually, some individual populations that seem to tolerate a little bit higher salt content. But uh, for the most part, having that very permeable skin that salamanders have um, doesn't lend them to be all that successful in anything with a, a salt content. I asked that question before your very helpful map showing kind of all of the isolated ponds are pretty far inland. But yeah, the, yeah, ahead but of mostly, that map, I was imagining like, oh, what if they get a little salty? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, when you're anywhere near the coast on the coastal plain, you're worried about rising water levels and, and increased salt intrusion, which is definitely a problem for a lot of things. Uh, but luckily, these are isolated wetlands and mostly I, uh, they're kind of centered on the, the ridge of the peninsula. Uh, between you know right where Maryland and, and Delaware uh you know meet is, is really where our populations are kind of concentrated. All right there's another question um there's a thank you for doing this important work and also sorry if I missed this but what are the population numbers estimated? Uh you know I don't I don't know that we we've, we've done any uh numbers in terms of you know trying to actually get get population estimates um the uh i should have pulled out some of scott's numbers from from last year again we, we do egg mass counts most years and i know last year uh were, were some record numbers we had some wetlands with like three to five hundred egg masses and then you need to really divide that in half or by th three to get the number of breeding females uh, in a population and, and generally it's kind of a 50 50 male to female sex ratio so some of these wetlands are at least have a couple hundred salamanders and we have again about 17 known extant wetlands so you, as you can kind of somewhat again and again if you're saying there's 100 or 200 salamanders in a pot in a particular breeding wetland that is not necessarily all of them because they're not necessarily all breeding in one year but uh you know, that's that's just uh you know spitballing that's not official any sort of uh, population modeling number all right i was going to encourage people to raise their virtual hands if they have a question and then they could ask on their own if they would like there are a few more coming into the chat. There's a really interesting one, I think. Um, if larva, I, I think it's supposed to be if larva are predatory and cannibalistic and you collect them and have them concentrated in buckets, would one of them eat the rest? Uh, it is definitely possible. Um, wow. So, uh, you know, like you said, for our translocation efforts, we were collecting the egg masses. Um, if you were to collect larvae, it'd be a good idea to keep them separate. Uh, there are, again, there are multiple breeding pulses typically uh, in the winter with different uh, events. And so you'll get larvae that are different sizes. If they're about the same size, they really won't be able to, you know, completely consume one another, but they will start biting at each other, biting, biting gills off and limbs off. Mm -hmm. They do have a uh, capability of regenerating limbs if that does happen. Uh, but, you know, that's certainly not what you want if you're doing any sort of translocation. But definitely easier uh, to collect the eggs. <laughs> you can kind of keep them all in a jar and you don't have to worry about that yet. Um, but yeah, throwing them all in, in one bucket could result in some some chaos. <laughs> that's kind of awesome and gruesome at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Somebody is asking, where is it? Gail is asking, can they live in the cypress swamps on the eastern shore? Uh, so our tiger salamanders don't live in that type of habitat. Uh, many of the cypress swamps uh, are, 
are directly connected to larger bodies of water. And oftentimes when they flood, they uh, do have predatory fish in them. Plus our cypress swamps are very, in general, very close canopied and don't have that herbaceous structure that the tiger salamanders like. We do find things like marbled salamanders and also spotted salamanders using those type of swamps, um, but not, not tigers. Kevin, I was wondering too, um, is it your chart that shows where they live and things, why aren't they in Florida? You know, there's a lot of water down there. Well, well, they are. They do occur down into northern Florida. They don't go down the peninsula of Florida. Uh, I think they maybe go down as far south as Gainesville or so. Uh, and then over to the, uh, the Panhandle and up into Alabama. The, the map I had is not certainly not completely accurate. It's a, a um, if I could find that real quick. Uh, you know, just a very uh, rough rough map. Um, actually, maybe a decade or so ago, there was a population found up just right around Atlanta. So really, you could draw that that. Uh, Georgia portion of it way up towards Atlanta, although it's, it seems to be pretty isolated. Actually, it's probably more connected to the to the west over to Alabama there than it is to the southern Georgia populations. But as I mentioned, a lot of these are very isolated. So that, that map is pretty generous. If you're really to draw the populations, you just have a spot here and a spot there and a spot here, uh, not encompassing this whole range of the coastal plain. But you see they do go down a little bit down the peninsula and then over the, the panhandle of Florida. Why they don't go further than that, I'm not quite sure, because Central Florida does have a lot of seasonal, uh, you know, these seasonal isolated depressional wetlands in that Central Florida Ridge, Sandy Ridge. Um, it may be too dry that the hmm. terrestrial forms may not be able to survive in those that really harsh scrub uh, environment. That would be my guess as to why they, they don't make it there, but. Excellent presentation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, anybody else have any more questions they would like to share? Yes, I see one here uh, on genetics. Fortunately, I can't answer that. I'm not sure. Uh, you would think. I mean, some genetics have been done when it came to to uh, splitting out eastern tiger salamanders from. In the western tiger salamanders, but I'm not sure anyone's looked more closely at how different the, the these isolated populations are. I mean, if they can really tell, it would be interesting to look to see if you can kind of get an idea of, of time, how long that these populations have been isolated. Even at a pretty smaller scale, like how long have our Kent County populations been isolated from Caroline County? I, you know, uh, hopefully not that long, but um, it's hard to say. Uh, Wish I had more more information on that. Carrie asking about randovirus. Um, we do know that we have randovirus within these wetlands. It's been detected. It does not, thankfully, seem to be impacting our eastern tiger salamanders. For those that don't know, randovirus is a, uh, a virus that has affected a lot of our frogs and some other salamanders, including the bistomatids. Uh, and it also infects, uh, interestingly, turtles, things like uh, box turtles are affected by randovirus, um, even though the virus is actually named after frogs. Um, so it really was first identified with our amphibians. Uh, we do, uh, uh, you know, do bleach our boots and, and waders and things like that between wetlands so that we're not trying to be the ones who are, are transporting these things between our wetlands um but uh it still finds a way uh, and i i have heard that again that coronavirus is detected in in some of our our wetlands that we know have tiger salamanders and yet we it, like i said last year was a record breeding event so we do still seem to be uh, 
you know, it doesn't seem to be affecting our tiger salamander populations. And we haven't found uh, a lot of mortality. When you do have rhinovirus show up in a wetland where it hasn't been previously, a lot of times you'll get die-offs. You'll see a lot of dead salamanders and frogs all at once. Um, mm -hmm. And and that is not something we've witnessed in these, these ponds. So that's a good thing. Uh, they're quite spread out climate and temperature wise. How do extreme temperatures during the breeding season affect numbers, usually cold winters, for example? Yeah, I mean, they go from Florida, uh, basically all the way up to Canada. Uh, and uh, they're, they're very cold hardy. As I mentioned, they're, they're breeding in the heart of winter here. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. uh, when there's ice on the water, the again, the, the males will move first usually in the early part of the winter and we've gone out uh and actually seen uh tiger salamanders under ice as long as the ice doesn't completely freeze the wetland you know it actually kind of provides an insulation if you get it you know an inch of water or ice on the top the water below will stay liquid and, and it, by definition it's it's above freezing there and the tiger salamanders can basically survive uh, for months in you know 30 mid 30s degree water um, with with no problem and you'll see them migrating over top of snow uh, so if you had an unusually cold winter like it did freeze through all the way through it definitely would kill them um, you could definitely get mortality if the salamanders moved during a, a cold rain uh, and then maybe started migrating back out and we're under a log when you got a really cold, cold snap, and they hadn't quite made it back down into a burrow deep enough. Um, but in general, they do do pretty well uh, in very cold conditions. So, very good. I think everybody is really hip and happy with the presentation. I, I and found it just fascinating. Um, so I appreciate your coming on and and uh, giving us a presentation. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to, anybody have anything else before we end the presentation? I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, Kevin. We will talk to you again and maybe have you on for uh, another, another go round and hopefully some better news. <laughs> on their on their on your efforts. <laughs> okay. Good night and have a happy holiday. Thank you all and happy holidays to you all too. Good night. Thank you.